Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow on some really unique fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Colonel Christopher Grice, who is Acting Director in the Joint Science and Technology Office at the United States Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, they are a combat support agency, part of the United States Department of Defense, ultimately focused on countering weapons of mass destruction, including chemical, biologic, radiologic, nuclear, and high explosives. Uh, and their mission ultimately enables the DOD and the United States government to prepare for and combat uh, WMD and improvised threats as well to, as to ensure nuclear deterrence. Uh, prior to uh, DITRA, Colonel Grice was the Director of Material for the Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff, Headquarters, Department of the Army, uh, as well as Division Chief for the Full Dimension Protection Division. In addition to those assignments, Colonel Grice also served uh, commanding the 69th Chemical Company uh, in Hanau, Germany, the Bluegrass Chemical Activity at the Bluegrass Army Depot in Kentucky and the Pueblo Chemical Depot in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, other key assignments included roles as instructor uh, and chief officer training at the CBRN School, a battalion executive officer and operations officer for the 110th Chemical Battalion uh, at Joint Base Lewis uh, in McCourt, Washington, uh, executive assistant to the director of the Joint Staff and counterproliferation branch chief for the Joint Staff, uh, senior strategic planner of the United States plans for the United States forces in Korea, uh, a native of Galesburg, Illinois, Colonel Grice uh, enlisted in the Army National Guard back in 1989. Uh, he earned an uh, undergraduate degree in biologic sciences from Southern Illinois University, uh, a commission that was commissioned in the chemical as a chemical officer in 1995. Colonel Grace then earned a master's uh, of science degree in environmental management from Webster University and a master's of science degree in joint campaign planning and strategy uh, from our National Defense University. A lot of really interesting topics to get into today. Uh, Colonel Christopher Grace, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. And of course, thank you for your long service to the United States. <laughs> well, wow, thank you. I appreciate you reading, reading that all out. <laughs> it seems like uh, all those things pass by in the blink of an eye. Um, it's been a great career in the Army, and, and I've been blessed uh, throughout my life and my career. Um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, I've been listening to some of your other podcasts, uh, enjoyed listening to Dr. Markowitz talk sure. for my ARPA. Um, you know, the, the people that you have interviewed, uh, just an amazing uh, stable of, of interesting uh, folks and the way you draw out uh, the information has been really neat. So I appreciate you reaching out and giving us this opportunity to talk to you and your audience. No, I, I appreciate you saying that, and, and it's it really it is it is great to have you. Um, a lot of really, I I thought we could spend about forty five minutes or so at the beginning talking about Star Trek, but I, I'll, we'll leave that for the end of the show. Um, I, a great place, you know. I, I'd love to start off, Chris, just uh, talking a little bit about you. I mean, you've had this fascinating career. I'd love to talk a little bit about sort of the early days, if you could sort of take us into everything from you know where you grew up, uh, a little bit of your uh, the, sort of the early development of your intellectual interest in biology. And of course, um, you know, what got you interested in national service to begin with uh, in the Army National Guard? I think that'd be a great place to uh, to start this whole story off. OK, um, well, well, again, to, to keep interest, <laughs> what I do now uh, for the Joint Science and Technology Office is, is really look into the future. Sure. Um, so things that seem like magic that just happened, like mRNA vaccines, mm -hmm. um, are really the result of sustained investment in that case over 10 years. Uh, to allow things to seem like they move at warp speed. And so I'll talk a little bit when we get there 
sure. uh, about how we do that in my current job. But my background, I think, prepared me to help lead this organization. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'll tell you three things really shaped me, I think. And, and uh, interesting, it made me reflect uh, as I was preparing to talk to you. Relationships, um, you know, those you create, those that you continue to build, and they're really important, those that you maintain. And that investment in relationships really gains value over time. Uh, and I've been blessed to have a lot of really good people that I've worked with over the years uh, and maintain contact with. Um, the other one's reading. Um, you know, grew up in a very small town. Um, you know, my parents were laborers, great people. Um, you know, really developed a, a mindset. If you work hard, you can achieve mm -hmm. anything. Um, you know, but but that idea of watching them work hard every day um, to take care of us, you know, that, that really is the core of who I am. <clears throat> Excellent. Wonderful. Um, and then, you know, being exposed to challenges, uh, you know, and, and maintaining, uh, I guess, best definition of plasticity of how you think, um, being able to see the world from different perspectives. Um, and again, that idea of reading uh, sci-fi, nonfiction, you know, all those things uh, really builds that curiosity, I, I think, in, in me and I think in others. Mm -hmm. um, and then last, um, you know, I have a deep respect and love for our country um, and the freedoms embodied in our Constitution. Um, so when I took that oath, <clears throat> and uh, I apologize, I didn't think uh, <laughs> it would be this emotional to talk about that, but I'm sitting here looking at a picture of my grandfather. <clears throat> and he was a uh, prisoner of war in World War II. And, uh, you know, he he went through a lot of things there at the end of the war uh, where he was a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me to, a, you know, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but he, he took me to a lot of those VFW events, uh, mm -hmm. talked to me about his experiences to a certain extent. Um, it, it just you know, his passion uh, for America uh, and what it meant for him to be uh, in World War II and be part of the liberators over there. Um, clearly, <laughs> that stuck with me. Absolutely. Absolutely. As it should, I mean, I, and I, I appreciate you folding that in about your, your parents and your grandparents and uh, sort of the, the long history there. But yeah, as I said, you know, for most of the people I talk to, it's not just about them. It's about, you know, everyone that came before and uh, and shaped who they were. So no, I, 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 I so much feel you per that part of your story. So I, I appreciate you sharing that, Chris. Um, you know, be, before we get into... Citra and a discussion of everything you have going on today, um, really on, on the cutting edge. I would love to take a brief stop um, per your commission as a chemical officer, because this is, you know, uh, you know, on the show, you know, per the sort of the CBRN continuum of uh, of sort of defense, uh, we talked a lot about the B, the R, and the N, not as much about the chemical. And, you know, when, when I look at sort of the, I go to the the Bluegrass and, and the Pueblo websites nowadays and sort of see sort of the extent of, you know, the countermeasure development, um, you know, the, the destruction of these agents, uh, the study of them and so forth. I mean, this is, I say, this is no joke. I mean, this is a, a position that probably not a lot of people it's not the first position to raise your hand for really dealing with some tough things, uh, whether it's VX or uh, and I'm not a chemical expert. Um, talk a little bit about this, because obviously this prepares you for everything that we're going to be getting into, at least on the C side, the C and B side of, uh, of DITRA. Say a little bit about what got you into the sort of the, the chemical officer path at that earlier point in your career. Yeah, sure. So I, I enlisted, uh, really to, to give me an opportunity to go to college, um, get, get out of my hometown there. I, I enlisted uh, as an air defense uh, person um, and then was exposed to being the CBRN uh, NCO uh, within my National Guard unit. Um, met some really great people and uh, started ROTC. I, I never thought I wanted to be an officer, uh, but I've met a guy named Sergeant Major H.R. Mahoney. Um, who ran the ROTC program uh, at, at a local college there in my hometown. And uh, he, he convinced me to go to Southern Illinois University. 
And uh, again, I'd kind of talked about um, my interest in reading. Um, mm -hmm. that, that got me very interested in biology. Um, you know, just a, a variety of influences there. Um, and I, I really was more interested in medicine when I, when I started out my career. Got it. Um, you know, I know a lot of people with, with different diseases and, and thought, wow, that, that would be great to be able to give back that way. Um, but, you know, life had a different plan for me. And, and so I went to Southern. Uh, and part of the other piece that I didn't talk about was the influence of uh, teachers. Um, so I had a high school biology teacher, Mr. Steve Peachy. You know, he got me really excited about science as well. Um, and that led to me seeking a degree in biological sciences there at Southern. So that really, I didn't realize this at the time, um, joining the army, you submit a bunch of different, uh, professions, um, and the army tells you where you're going. So I got picked mm -hmm. to be a CBRN officer, um, really didn't know what that was at the time. Um, but, but it has been awesome, uh, because it's allowed me to go throughout a bunch of different units across my career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've obviously had commands that are focused on CBRN issues, as you kind of talked about. Um, but I also was able to serve uh, at Fort Bragg in an airborne artillery unit. Um, got to jump out of planes there. The, the link to CBRN is that we had collimators that, that helped uh, set the guns. Uh, there was tritium inside the collimators. Um, so <laughs> lots of opportunities there to think about the exposure of radiation, although it's very small. Um, and then just thinking about, you know, how do you uh, apply our uh, particular skill set into those other units? Um, same thing in an infantry unit in Germany, um, deploying into Kosovo uh, with 2nd Brigade 1st Armored Division. Um, you know, the really interesting thing there, then the exposure of trying to understand the impact of what we call ticks and Thames, um, because there were a lot of other hazards there uh, in Kosovo. Um, but that really led up to my command of 6-9 Chemical Company. Um, and that company was a triple purpose company located in Germany and took command shortly before the war um, and deployed that unit into Baghdad in 2003. Um, that unit was composed of a uh, reconnaissance uh, platoon that had the Fox vehicle um, that could seal itself up and try to detect chemical agents outside the vehicle and radiation. Um, four decontamination platoons uh, and a maintenance platoon. Um, about 150 people spread all around Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was a really challenging command, but, but it was important at the time. We, we thought we'd have to uh, deal with the use of chemical weapons right. in that environment. Um, and so before we deployed, the, those four decom platoons got a real workout. They, they practiced decontamination on all the units that were deploying um, as part of the 1st Armored Division uh, in Grafenveer and Hohenfels. Um, so luckily, we, we didn't have to put that to use. Um, we did use the Fox vehicles to try to, uh, identify chemical weapons in different, different areas. Um, we're in support of a lot of different things, but as that war changed, um, we did a lot of other things. Um, we ran a NGO airfield at the Baghdad airport. Okay. Um, so all of the NGO resources flowed through that airport and we managed it as it came in, um, that, that was really interesting. One of my decom, decom platoons had that mission. Um, we were security for prisoner transport, um, moving prisoners around the battlefield, um, did remote site security, um, it, lots of things there. But that real world work of how does this equipment that we've been issued um, work in the field? Um, how do we sustain it? Um, what are the importance of the logistics to it? Um, and then really, again, for CBRN officers, how do we integrate into the broader uh, combat units? Um, how do we bring that particular skill set in? So that's where a lot of my time was in my early years. And then coming out of Iraq, I got to teach at the schoolhouse at Fort Leonard Wood. And there, you know, we got to change the curriculum, uh, make it more about uh, small scale use, uh, potential small labs, you know, how do you identify those? Um, how do you support kind of the turn from large scale combat to uh, low intensity conflict type operations? 
Um, so really enjoyed that opportunity, one, to teach, but two, then to update the curriculum so that all those officers that, that went through training uh, were ready for what faced them over the next 20 years in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Um, but, but now getting to where you were really asking, um, bluegrass chemical activity, uh, where I commanded, we stored 500 tons of both uh, VX uh, nerve agent, GB, and mustard agent. Um, so the nerve agent, obviously very dangerous. Um, we had persistent agent. We had non-persistent agent. Um, we had a lot of mustard agent. Uh, the nerve agent weapons were stored in M55 rockets, uh, which presented a whole another challenge that I'll talk about in just a minute. Sure. Um, but, but the overall intent was to keep that stockpile safe. Right. Um, and so we did that in a lot of different ways. Um, one was by monitoring. Um, so really got into how do we make sure uh, that those munitions are not leaking. And if we do have any type of uh, event, you know, how do we package that munition and, and make it safe? Um, that was a smaller command uh, than Pueblo. Uh, but the impact of an accident at that location was exponentially higher. Um, because we have ner nerve agent, um, you know, there were, I think, 12 counties in that region. Uh, a really bad accident could have impacted over 50,000 people in that area. Um, so I'm really proud of the work that, that I did there for the time that I was the commander. Um, really exposed me to just a host of different things that we had to deal with. Um, one was, you know, obviously the storage that I've talked about, making sure right. that was done safely, preparing to move those munitions to be destroyed. Um, that was a pretty big deal because now you're taking them out of static storage uh, and moving them to the destruction plant. Um, you know, what you don't want to do is do that because <laughs> <'cause laughs> you're exposing that hazard out of containment. Right. Um, but, you know, worked with the team to figure out the best way to do that. And, and I'm proud to say I was part of that at the beginning. And now they're working through destroying a uh, significant portion of those munitions yeah. of bluegrass. Yeah. Um, big part of it was was doing something called the Community Stockpile Emergency Preparedness Plan. Um, so the, the Army uh, put a lot of money into making sure that community was well prepared in, in the event of an accident. Yeah. And then we exercised that once a year, um, really bringing in a whole host of capability into that small community in Richmond, Kentucky, um, to make sure that if anything ever happened, uh, they were very well prepared. Um, and, and really the residual effect of that is that we helped build a lot of the emergency management centers throughout those different counties. Um, did outreach uh, to the communities there to, to talk to the schools, uh, get them excited about science. We even had a trailer uh, that we'd take around to, to different events and to schools. Uh, got into the schools and talked about opportunities, you know, just like I had uh, joining the Army, opportunity to go to college, opportunity to see the world yeah. um, and do a lot of different neat things. Um, and then engaging with those com communities again, um, each month we, we had a local event. Uh, it was televised. It was recorded, um, you know, explaining what, what the, where we were at in the project, mm -hmm. um, working with what was then called BG Cap. Uh, the Bluegrass Chemical Agent Destruction Pilot Plant. Uh, unique thing there, they were using new technology to try to destroy those weapons. Uh, both at Bluegrass and at Pueblo, uh, those communities decided they did not want incineration. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so we put a lot of money into finding an alternative way uh, to destroy those munitions that the community was comfortable with. Um, and, and so a lot of work there, environmental permitting exposed me to that whole process, yeah. um, which, which was really interesting. The communities get a vote. Um, they get to hear and, and get described to them what we're doing in, in, a, in a lot of detail um, to make sure that they're okay with that happening in their communities. Right. Um, and, and then at Pueblo, um, you know, much larger stockpile of just mustard agent, um, but in a much more remote area. Um, those munitions were stored in a high desert environment. Um, you know, not a lot of uh, neighbors in that area. Um, and, and so the, the hazard wasn't as big, um, but, but the mission was very large, just to the quantity of munitions that we stored uh, and, and the process there to destroy it at the PCAP plant uh, or the Pueblo uh, 
pilot plant uh, for destruction. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the bigger part of that, then I was the installation commander. Um, so yeah. really trying to think through not only all those security things that I talked about at Bluegrass and the movement of munitions to the plant, but even on a bigger scale, that was a Bracked installation. Um, how do we now not only get rid of the chemical weapons, but start to turn over um, 23,000 acres of land? Um, and so we even had uh, private industry on uh, the Pueblo chemical depot. Um, there was a company that was building uh, tiny homes. Um, that, that was kind of neat. They were using some of our warehouses to do that. <laughs> um, just a host of other private industry that we were bringing in, uh, managed by something called Pueblo Plex, uh, that was managing the rental and, and of those properties. Um, again, with the intent of these communities, you know, allowed us to store our weapons in their area. Right. Um, we're, we're safely trying to store those and get rid of those munitions and then really have a plan for what is that land going to be used for? Um, cause the e economic impact of pulling, uh, that work out of those communities is, is enormous. Sure. Um, most of the people in the community either were related to or worked, uh, on that installation. Um, so, so really try to have a plan of how do we sustain those communities after the mission is over. Um, so, so those are really exciting, uh, positions, um, a lot of exposure to how not only the United States, but others, uh, are inspected by the OPCW, okay. uh, the organization for Prohibit prohibition of chemical weapons. Yep. Um, once a year at each of those installations, uh, they came in and did a fairly detailed inspection, uh, checked the treaty tags to make sure that we were doing what we said we were doing. Um, and, and we're very professional. Um, and then that alignment, uh, to the defense threat reduction agency, where I work now with JSTO, yep. um, there, there's a whole section here that does nothing but coordinate those visits. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so a lot of neat things there. Um, I, again, the, the key to all of that um, was really being dedicated to taking care of those munitions, having uh, ways to detect, um, and then having ways to respond in the event of a leak, um, mm -hmm. which we did have several over time. As the pressure changed, uh, those munitions would have small, uh, we, we, we did sometimes call them burps because they were very, very small uh, releases inside the igloo. Um, and then the ability to overpack and, and uh, take care of those munitions. Um, lots of other interesting things happened within those commands. Uh, everything from dealing with unions, uh, which was a new experience for me as an sure. army officer. Um, but, but it was a good experience too, um, that, that there was an opportunity um, for workers to have their voice heard. Uh, most of it was on working conditions. Um, but, but a real education for me on, on how to deal with, with unions, uh, with government employees. A um, few other just unique things we did while we were there. At Bluegrass, um, we actually separated uh, 91 of those nerve agent warheads uh, from the rockets uh, in preparation for destruction. What we were looking for, we were concerned that, that the rockets had been exposed to moisture and, and uh, had potentially started to create some hydroglycerin uh, on, on the rocket bodies, obviously okay. not a good thing, uh, no. when you've got a nerve agent where we're <laughs> attached to it. Um, so, so that was very unique as, as we planned out that operation again, had to talk to the community, explain what we were doing and why, uh, even to the congressional leadership, uh, for that, that region, um, put in place, uh, different exercises. Again, you, you didn't want to do things with the initiatives. In this case, we were doing something significant. Um, believe it or not, they just unscrewed, uh, off of the, the warhead, literally unscrewed off, off the rocket body. Mm -hmm. Um, but went through a whole host of community exercises, um, where, where we went through every possible contingency. If something were to go wrong, um, how would we deal with that? And actually exercised it. Uh, and again, happy to say that all of that work, um, led to the safe operation of separating those warheads. Yep. Uh, from the rocket bodies, sending those rocket bodies off for analysis. Again, that allowed for uh, destruction of those warheads that's going on right now at, at Bluegrass. Yep. Um, again, different environment, interesting environment up in the high desert in Colorado. 
uh, at Pueblo. It was about uh, an hour uh, south of uh, Colorado Springs. Um, forest fires were, were really uh, a scary thing out there. Mm. Um, the, there were several times when, when uh, there would be a forest fire that would start uh, on the interstate and that worked its way toward the depot. Um, again, th those aren't contingencies you normally think of when you're trying right. to think about how to store and manage chemical weapons. Exactly. Um, but we had two fire departments on the installation um, and they worked uh, with the local community uh, and got out there with, when the, those things occurred to, to cut through brush and, and create fire breaks to make sure that that never actually impacted uh, the depot. But but obviously very concerning <laughs> when you're standing out at the depot full of chemical weapons and, and you can see off in the distance uh, forest fire marching towards you. Um, it, and again, just kind of a, a somewhat random but, but uh, interesting thing there at Pueblo. Great that we were having all that work uh, on the depot. Uh, but again, introduced risk uh, into the depot where we were storing the weapons. And, uh, you know, we did have a fire in, in one of the warehouses uh, where they were doing some work uh, with welding. And uh, it, not, a, not a fun time to be driving uh, into work on the weekend and, and see plumes of smoke uh, over your installation. I can imagine. Um, yeah, but, but again, <laughs> you know, the, the importance of doing drills, Right. of uh, having contingencies in place. We never thought that would happen, uh, but we had contingencies in place with the fire departments um, that they isolated that warehouse. It, it did burn down. Fortunately, there was nobody hurt, uh, no significant loss of property other, other than the warehouse itself. Um, but, but, you know, just the complexity of pulling all those things together um, it, and, and really probably the most memorable thing, working to get the right technology that's going to work to get those munitions uh, destroyed and, and out of those communities. Um, that, that was just really great work. Big host of people uh, from the ones that were actually maintaining the weapons uh, to all the engineers designing the plant. Uh, the environmental folks I had a whole environmental department uh, that worked with the contract agency to make sure that everything was done the right way. Um, had considered all the potential impacts and, and had a plan not only to, to build, destroy the weapons, but then to remove those facilities at the back end so that, again, mm -hmm. those communities don't have to worry about any of that. A um, lot there. It was really interesting time uh, to, to be there, to be in command. Um, and again, I think we're really moving close to achieving that end state of destroying all uh, of the U.S. chemical stockpile here, potentially by the end of the year, early in 2024. Outstanding, really outstanding. And, and, and yeah, and again, clearly, you know, uh, one piece in the in the Chris Gray story of why you're here now, doing what you're doing now at Ditra. Um, and you know, it's um, <laughs> your your role um, now is is quite broad, uh, you know, as you said in the intro, sort of beyond chemicals, sort of the, the full spectrum uh, of WMD issues. Um, DITRA has this mission, uh, deter, prevent, prevail, deter strategic acts in the United States, prevent weapons of mass destruction, emerging threats, and ultimately prevailing against our adversaries. Of course, I was if you could just take us a little bit into uh, the history of the organization, because I know sort of its genesis was back at sort of the end of the Cold War and sort of the, the joint inspection uh, regimes of, of Soviet bloc countries and, and, and the United States and so forth. At the same time, and, and I, I recommend everyone listening and watching the show to go take a look at Colonel Grice's presentation uh, from a couple of months ago, the 2022 uh, Chem Biodefense Science and Technology Conference, where you introduce, you know, the theme of simply better ain't enough for what we're doing here. I mean, this is radical innovation. And, and you know, like we hear at, at groups like DARPA and, and, and uh, ONR and so forth, um, we, we need to be exponential here because when we're dealing with some of these, as you were just explaining, uh, simply better is not enough. Talk a little bit about um, that part of your mission and a little bit of sort of the day-to-day -day directives per DITRA. Yeah, sure. And I guess to set that up a little further, I, I am the Joint Science Technology Office. I work at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, but all of my funding comes through the Chemical Biological Defense Program or the CBDP. 
Okay. And, and that's organized uh, under uh, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Newt Kimbayo, uh, Ms. Rosenblum. Okay. Um, and then underneath that is Mr. Ian Watson, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary yep. of Defense for Chem Bio Defense Program. Um, so, so really, they're they're providing a lot of my guidance. I'm organized under DITRA and work here. Um, just quickly on the CBDP mission: anticipate future threats, deliver capabilities, enable the Joint Fire Force to fight and win in chemical and biological contested environments. That that's what we do. Um, why we do that, and it's somewhat unique, um, we're a defense-wide fund. So normally, uh, each service uh, has money to organize that particular service. So the Army gets money and executes it, Navy uh, and the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, this money uh, was pooled from the services given to the Chem Bio Defense Program to ensure that the services were adequately prepared to fight in a Chem Bio environment. Uh, so just scene setting, that, that's kind of the background. Okay. But as you talked about, um, you know, a lot of things are going on um, in this space right now um, that make the threat real. Um, I really think I, ta I talked about the OPCW, you know, mm -hmm. it's part of the CWC, the BWC. The innovation in technology right now, I think, is really challenging those organizations' ability um, to influence the use or non-use of these type of weapons and agents. Um, the ability to literally develop an entirely new agent uh, using bioscience, using even, uh, if you will, digital laboratories, the, the ability to look at different ways of structuring things and then creating something that gets around some of those norms created by the CWC and BWC um, it, it is really scary and very disruptive right now. Um, so a lot of the things that I talked about at the conference um, is our response to do that. Um, so you had IARPA on, um, uh, Dr. Markowitz talking about uh, biodetection, yep. um, bioinformatics, um, th those type of things. That's a key area we're concerned with, um, being able to identify genetically modified uh, substances. Um, how do we do that? That's a really big task. Um, and, and really uh, using that same technology uh, to understand how do we think about things that might happen. Um, being able to do something we call threat agent science um, to think about the, the negative potentials uh, of that expanding uh, ability to really create our, our own unique biology. Um, so as we lead through s and um, really there's three key areas we're focused on. Um, integrated early warning, trying to identify that for the warfighter um, across multiple locations, multiple technologies. Um, integrated layered defense, you know, do we have the right protection uh, for those soldiers, airmen and Marines? Um, and then that preparing for surprise piece that I, that I was talking about. And really, I bend those things into three areas that we work on in, in the S&T realm here at JSTO. Threat identification. What are the new threats that we're being exposed to? ASD Rosenblum talks about that pivot as we're going from those smaller scale conflicts uh, back to great power competition, where, where there are a range of different threats uh, that we have to deal with. Um, and then for me, a lot of it is creating that space for innovation to do those unique things, to find unique ideas mm -hmm. um, to do that. And so we need the funding, we need uh, sustained funding in order to do that. Um, and then a key piece is reducing risk for transition. So we're finding these new things in the s and space. Uh, and then how do we de-risk those things in order to transition them to our advanced development partner who now creates an actual capability that gets delivered to the warfighter. Um, so some of those neat things that we're working on and some of the things I talked about at the conference. Um, med key, being able to identify active bacteria and viral in infections mm -hmm. you know, out there and quickly. And, and getting those things to a point where you can do it in the field uh, as far forward as possible to identify 
any potential illnesses out there. Um, rate and prep, um, things that we can do where, where it's wearable technology. Right. Um, can you wear a, a watch and a ring and be able to detect across a spectrum of, of war fighters when there's an illness? So you can isolate it early um, and, and identify that issue before it spreads through the larger force. Yep. Um, lots of interesting things there within the wearables. Uh, you know, there, there's another technology that we're working on that's an in-ear device um, that actually provides a lot different data, uh, biological data from the warfighter than even the watch in the ring. Uh, and then a really neat area we're going to from there is now taking all of that data and trying to extrapolate that to understand how do we see illness really early. Um, so there's a lot of data that we've developed from these exercises or, and these tests. Um, now, how do you take that and use that data to identify things that are happening be before it becomes an issue? Um, thing called FFAST, uh, Far Forward Advanced Sequencing. Uh, again, all, all of these things are about getting it in the smallest form factor with low logistics packages. But if you can uh, do that type of analysis, detection of emerging pathogens far forward, um, again, we can start to isolate that problem and, and identify solutions. Um, organ on a chip technology or organoid technology. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, th those are really exciting and a real challenge for us right now. We were just on a meeting uh, with the National Security Council uh, and OSTP yesterday um, talking about how do we uh, improve our ability to get these through the FDA? How do we improve our ability to reduce the use of non-human primates um, and, a lot, and testing? All of those things are together there. If we can get to that point, um, we're advancing to the point of testing uh, either medical prophylaxis, how to fix somebody and the impacts on, on human organs on those chips without exposing it to a human, or testing these unknowns, uh, again, on that human on a chip, if we can get all the organs on and, and make them actually flow between each other, um, and get that approved through the FDA, we could really transform how we create medicines, how we create countermeasures, and more, just as important, how we identify the impacts of unknown agents on the human body. Um, domain, um, discovery medical countermeasures against new and emerging threats, um, working through uh, a system using artificial intelligence and machine learning, Mm -hmm. uh, again, that idea of a, a virtual laboratory, if you will, sure. um, to, again, identify emerging threats uh, and understand the potential effects of them. Um, linked along to that is something called PATNOS, pathogenesis and toxicity forecasting with multi-organoid systems. Again, that's going back to the organ on a chip, but can right. you really get it to a human on a chip? Um, Chemical diagnostics, again, I, I don't think we're out of the realm of having chemical weapons used. Um, a lot of the focus is on bio due to COVID, right. um, but getting smaller, more accurate devices uh, to give early warning and potential exposure, even at small scale. Um, another neat place we're going to in the medical arena is Raptor, uh, being able to assess multiple platforms. And, and so you've got the platform that you can deliver the drug, now you just add the drug into that particular platform uh, and identifying which is the best one for those different type of medications. Um, the idea of all of that is really trying to speed up the response time to an emerging a infectious agent. You know, that, that is where we're being driven uh, by the new biological strategy. I think that's where we'll be driven uh, by the BPR when it's released. And I, I think it'll be released very soon. Chris, if um, you know when, when I go to the Ditra website, there is a there's a section on the active contracts that you have out there, and you know people can go check out what you know the products to be worked on, what you're looking for. Talk a little. I mean, if, if for instance, you know, one of them, research and development services to study nanomedicine countermeasures to overcome antimicrobial resistance. Um, if I'm a uh, a university researcher or a small company that has that <laughs> and I want to collaborate with Ditra, how, how does all of that work? Because clearly, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're an awesome comp country as far as uh, biotech, thousands of companies and thousands more labs out there. 
How does the collaboration ultimately with the private sector, I mean, it seems to go both ways. You're looking for certain things and ultimately interesting things that are developed can be, uh, have dual use in the private sector. And a little bit about, there, there's something that on the website also, this mentor program that uh, that talks about, you know, how ultimately the ways that you can expedite how small businesses can access some of these interesting contracts. Yeah, sure. So, you know, there's a couple of ways. Um, we do uh, a tech watch seminar. Um, so, so if you, anybody wants to reach out to us, uh, online through our Ditra Jesto, uh, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or out to me personally, um, I could connect you, uh, with Dr. Akbar Khan, who runs our, uh, tech watch program that that's yeah. anything that's new and exciting and interesting. Um, not sure where it fits. We, we bring those folks in so they can present, uh, what, what their new thing is that they're working on a and then how we announce uh different projects uh for people to compete against um so we utilize what are called broad agency announcements okay um, those are solicitations for basic or fundamental research uh for the things that we're trying to get after um, those are typically open to universities um, industry and, and nonprofit research institutions however you know those will be reviewed uh, for eligibility and application criteria as they come in um, there's a website called sam.gov, uh, contract opportunities, uh, for folks, if they want to compete for some of those contracts. Excellent. And then our, uh, announcements are, are, uh, pilot BAAs right now, if you looked out there, there's pilot BAAs, there will be more specific, uh, BAAs that will be announced. Um, then for small business. Um, we actually have an office of small business here at DITRA, and you can get there through the DITRA website, uh, DITRA.mil, work with us, office of small business. Um, and there's guidance on the website of, of how you submit uh, to work with us as a small business. Then I've recently, you know, as a result of some of the Tech Watch events, um, have my team developing kind of a one-pager uh, for small business to really give them that opportunity to understand what are the ins and outs uh, to really be successful w when they apply uh, to do work. Um, the other thing that I do a lot of, and I did it both here in my current job and my previous job on the Army G8, um, is interacting with industry. Um, so there's lots of different industry groups out there that host a, a variety of events uh, to expose, you know, people like me working in the government uh, to industry and small business. Um, they'll bring in and have booths where they can demonstrate some of their technology. Um, and we can have a dialogue um, mm -hmm. be because really there's a return on investment in, in two directions for me as, as the JSTO director. You know, the return on investment is to, to the warfighter is that industry is where our innovation lives. So people wanting to create new things, wanting to solve hard problems, um, that those people exist in industry and in academia, and we have the ability to fund that research to, to do those things. Um, and at the end of the day, that creates new capability for the warfighter. The other part is going back and talking to industry about where are those gaps? Where are the things that we have hard problems we can't solve now? And where does your technology potentially help us solve those problems? Um, so really trying to connect the return on investment to the warfighter and to industry. Um, so ideally we, we bridge over between that S and T part to that advanced developer to actually create a capability. And then there's literally return on investment, uh, to the industry partner who's doing work for us. Um, then there's a lot of other neat things out there. Uh, Carl Brown's on and he, he leads, uh, along with his team. Some of the other engagements you probably didn't see at the conference. So we funded and brought in uh, students from different universities to present okay. their ideas at the conference. That's awesome. um, it, it was really amazing. And, and the ideas uh, that are out there uh, in, our, in our universities uh, are just amazing. Uh, they're taking some of these things like metal organic frameworks um, and coming up with a wide variety of uses and ideas for them. Um, you know, we're interested in those from a protection and potentially decontamination right. um, because they can actually break down materials. You know, they were thinking up ideas of how to reduce carbon emissions from vehicles. You know, can you yeah. put that in, in a 
in a vehicle. It, lots of other thoughts and ideas. Um, and then we do mentoring. Um, you know, we've maintained contact with those students that came and, and presented. Um, DITRA, and again, I'm part of DITRA, but these are actually DITRA programs. Um, there's a STEM program uh, to really try to introduce uh, folks into, you know, the idea of doing this type of work and then doing this type of work for government. Uh, tremendous opportunities out there within the STEM program. And then Carl runs a, a smaller one for the CBDP uh, that targets middle school kids, yeah. um, brings them together uh, with some of our national labs and gives them the opportunity to experience science with scientists, uh, awesome. create projects. And again, we stay in contact with them. And uh, hopefully, you know, we're creating little scientists that are going to solve some of the world's hardest problems in the future. And so that's a really exciting thing to be a part of, above and beyond just the new science uh, that our different divisions are working on, our PhD scientists. And then I did want to just, while well, I've got the opportunity to talk about them, sure. because I think they are really uh, the center of gravity for the work that we do. Um, so in my detection division, I've got Dr. Rich Shosky. Um, he's got a really good team. Uh, working on smaller, lower energy detectors. Um, you know, can you toss those detectors out and, and not worry about them if they get destroyed? Can you drop them out of uh, drones with smaller drones? I mean, there's lots of neat ideas out there of how do you do detection without exposing right. uh, soldiers and sailors and airmen, Marines to, to those environments. Um, Dr. Han John Hannon, uh, really neat guy, an Iron Man's competed in, in Hawaii but also trying to bring together that integrated early warning. How do we bring together all those different sensors and put it into something called Cynet so that now a commander in the field can make a decision off of multiple detectors. Mm. Um, he's leading a lot of that wearables work for us um, it, and then creating the software to pull that all together and put it on a platform like TAC that you can see the battlefield. Um, he's doing some really neat stuff. Dr. Aaron Reichert, uh, my medical team, Working through, she, she's done, and her team, uh, working on Ebola um, yep. vaccine, leading into work on Marburg. Um, she's leading all those different medical things that I talked about, from Raptor to Domain to Patmos. Um, again, trying to get the medical community to get to the speed of, of the need um, if we were to ever have another event. Um, Dr. Brad Norwood. Um, works our threat agent science and our Kim, uh, med Kim portfolios. Um, mm -hmm. He's the one doing a lot of neat work there with how do we get machine learning to predict the future for us and potentially AI. You know, how do we understand what's going on out there so that we can start to do work to address those threats before they're even real? That is some really exciting space that, that Dr. Norwood's in. Uh, Dr. Charles Chuck Bass, uh, working on protection, decon, elimination. You know, he, he and his team have created waterless decon. They're working on automated robotic decontamination. Again, so you don't have to put soldiers out, out into those environments and sailors and airmen and Marines. If you can have a robot do it, it can go get dirty, do that hard work of decon. And, and even working across our other uh, directorates, like with Dr. Hannon, so that we have technology that can identify where that contamination is and be very focused, reducing the logistical burden. Um, and then another neat area, Mr. Tom Music leads our uh, Warfighter Integration Division, and he does leads something called SOBOA, our Chemical Biological Operation Analysis. Okay. He actually takes soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, puts them out in an exercise with equipment that is at low levels of development. And really, again, what we're trying to do there is for the soldier, is this something that you need? And then they're giving feedback directly to industry on, is this the right form factor? Do I need it in a different way? Do I need it to communicate differently? Is this really something that I can use in my job? So mm -hmm. Saboa does that for us. Uh, ATDs, Advanced Technological, technological Demonstrations, um, taking a little bit more advanced technology and again, putting in the hands of warfighters to get that feedback to industry. You know, is this something that you can use? Um, how does it fit into our future operating concepts? Um, right now, this week, we're doing scientists in action. We're taking scientists out of the government labs 
and then sending them off to do work with soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. They're out at Camp Pendleton, I think, this week uh, doing work. It, it really is interesting to get, hear the responses from the scientists when they get out of the lab and see how soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are using the things they're working on. It, it really just totally changes how they approach uh, some of those solutions. Um, and then last, getting into future operating environments, really trying to understand, working with the services, what does 2040 look like mm -hmm. for you? How are you going to operate in 2040? And a lot of that's dispersed. And, and again, you know, trying to get the low logistics. Um, th there's a, a lot of work there as we try to think about the future. Not only what are the opportunities and, and the technology, but how does that technology now work within those services? Right. Um, because they're going to, you know, that pipeline we're starting, you know, where I started out talking about uh, mRNA vaccines, you know, what is that thing that we're working on now that'll fit into that 24 order operating environment uh, for the services? Um, got a whole host of other folks here. Dr. Botto does my basic research. Uh, Dr. Neil Jensen works up at Aberdeen Proving Grounds and put postdoctoral students uh, into different positions uh, there at Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And, and then Mr. Eric Lowenstein leads kind of our business division of CBC, uh, contracting, resource management, all those things that are really important because you've got to manage the money sure. well to enable the science. Uh, so just, uh, again, people, relationships, so important in everything that, that I've done across my career. And I just wanted to highlight that those people and, and Carl brings it all together as my strategist uh, and key communicator, um, you know, just they do amazing things. It, it, and it's just so awesome cool. to be a part of this organization. Chris, one thing you mentioned um, at the beginning and then also in your uh, the, the CBD conference presentation was, you know, you work with industry, you work with these government innovation centers, the IARPAs and DARPAs, um, but you also have the regulators out there. And it's very timely that we're doing this recording because just yesterday I had uh, Dr. Uh, Namajay Bumpus on from FDA uh, who introduced us to their medical countermeasures enterprise that they prepare for to work to working with you in the sense, you know, we, we're in a new environment where we can't wait 20 years to approve the, the next mRNA vaccine against the God forbid XYZ virus. Talk about that part of sort of your day to day and sort of how you interface with regulators, whether it's a new vaccines or brain computer interfaces or all the other cool stuff you're doing. Yeah, sure. So it, it's it's all about data with the FDA. Yeah. Um, so so what I think we're really challenged to do, and, and I was out at uh, one of our performers uh, last month, you know, getting access to that data, whether it's in, in the VA network, um, it, it, any place where you can gather the amount of data to make the FDA feel comfortable um, that, that what they're approving or what they're potentially approving is viable and that it's not going to have unintended consequences. Um, you, you know, within, um, between the Joint Program Executive Office and the, the Joint Science, the JSTO, uh, Joint Science Tech, Technical mm -hmm. Office, we've got uh, a combined effort uh, that, that does the interface there with the FDA and the regulators. Yeah. Um, so it's Bio One, uh, Dr. Reichert's very involved with them. Um, they help us bring together uh, all of our data, identify what's the priority to then engage with the FDA um, to, to get their reviews of, of our products. Um, a lot of the work we're doing in something called medical architecture is also trying to accelerate the creation of that data um, so that then we can continue to operate uh, with the FDA to gain those approvals rapidly. Um, so, so a lot of, lot of interesting work there, a lot of challenges there. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to go into more detail on that one, no. but, but, uh, but, but th there's a lot of challenges in that area too, but it all comes back to getting the data, getting in a format that can be consumed um, and, and making the FDA comfortable with that data. Um. Because in the presentation, you know, you talked about the uh, uh, the Dr. McCoy slash Bones tricorder 
Um, and, and I know that was a DARPA program a couple of years ago, focus on that. And you also you also mentioned Leonardo da Vinci and sort of the things that he thought about a couple hundred years ahead of his time. Um, any other cool things that we that we haven't touched on? I mean, there was a million things in this database that's, that's on there from wearable gamma neutron detectors to nano reactors for wound decontamination. What, what else excites you personally in terms of what's going on at Ditra? Any, any specific projects that you want to highlight that uh, they specifically didn't uh, mention at this point? But please, make the floor. Yeah, we, we talked, uh, I, I think, metal organic frameworks. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's an area. And again, a lot of this new science, new technology, who knows where it ends up? Um, right. You know, we're, we're thinking about it in one way now in, in protection, but it could have completely alternative uses in the future. Um, so, so what I'm really interested to see is where some of this goes 10 years from now. Um, where's that thing that we started to work on now, like the mRNA environment? Yep. Where does that end up at in the future? Um, and, and really trying to work through, for me, where does it apply to the DOD? Um, but, but I think a lot of these things that we're working on have much broader applications. The application of AI and machine learning. Um, you know, the, there's work going on to try to get to the right level of computing power that will just exponentially increase our, our ability to manipulate biology um, virtually. Uh, you know, that, that is both scary <laughs> and incredibly exciting. Um, that, that we have the ability um, to come up with different ideas if we can get to the point where AI can start to manipulate it and even have different thoughts that, you know, we may be impeded as humans. We, we just don't think that same way. But if the algorithms start to think in ways that we never even imagined, who knows what that'll create. Mm -hmm. um, and the opportunity to then both use that in a, in a way of defense um, but be able to defend ourselves if, if there's another uh, opportunity that somebody's taking with, with that technology. Um, I was just talking to my son about this uh, yesterday, that the potential for biotechnology, the yeah. ability to create and sustain ourselves, create our own supply chain through biological processes. Um, can we move away from some of our traditional industry and turn that into a biological process? Um, is there a way um, to, to onshore uh, some of that work that, that we export because you're actually literally creating uh, the base equipment, the base uh, requirements uh, to create new things? Uh, I think there's tremendous opportunities there. And there's a host of different organizations looking at that, trying to create consortiums um, to come together because obviously a lot of regulation potentially there. Sure. You know, how do we manage that? How do we make it quality uh, products? Um, and then just thinking about how do you use it? I mean, there's a ton of different ways uh, to potentially develop um, new materials. Uh, be, it, it, it's interesting as we sort of go forward by going backwards, mm -hmm. um, understanding our bodies, understanding the natural environment, and then recreating some of those things that work through nature uh, over millions of years of development, how do we reverse engineer that? I mean, that's already going on in many spaces, um, but, but the idea of biomimicry, you know, understanding oh, yeah. how current processes work um, and then taking those and applying them at whatever problem we've got. Um, so just thinking out loud, I mean, those are some of the really exciting things I think that are out there. And, and again, the computing power, the exponential development potential. Standing, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting future, and and it's just uh, your your portfolio is amazing, and I just you know re really wish you the best with all of this, Chris, because it's uh, it's just so um, you're in such a sweet spot, you know, per what we've been talking about on on some of these past episodes to. Uh, to really make such an impact, both in defending our our soldiers and at the same time creating this amazing innovation for uh, for for the private sector as well. So really, really fascinating. Um, you, you just because you mentioned you mentioned your son. Um, I also, you know, I have a couple kids in this in in my house here, and I, I made them watch your. <laughs> 
your your presentation they thought you were you know the fact that you brought the jetsons and star trek into your presentation they thought that was the the coolest thing in the world uh, and so you know as part of the lightning round today um they they helped me draft a, a, a series of questions for you and i i thought it'd be fun just to wrap up uh as i am a also a child of the 60s and 1970s uh, so, um, that being said, uh, we might as well just dive right into these. Uh, first one coming from my daughter. Uh, she wants to know what your, your favorite Star Trek episode was. Oh, what was the one with the little, uh, the fuzzies? The fuffle. Yeah. 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 Fuffle. The troubles. With, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Absolutely. Um, my son, my son wanted to know as a kid, would you rather have a phaser or go through the transporter? I think the phaser, the transporter kind of scares me. I, I'm always yeah. afraid you'd be scrambled when you came out the other end. Okay, awesome. Uh, again, from my son, uh, would you rather in the Jetsons have the flying car that folds into your briefcase or have all those interesting devices that, you know, allow you to pop out of bed, brush your teeth, dress you, make your breakfast for you and prepare you for your day? <laughs> so I live in D.C., I would definitely take the flying car. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the last one, they're coming back to my daughter now. Um, this is an interesting one. She wants to know, you know, if you were living in the Jetsons world, would you rather work at Spacely Sprockets or Cogswell Cogs? Uh, Spacely Sprockets, I think. Okay. There you go. Yep. <laughs> well, thanks. That was fun. <laughs> that was fun. Chris, really, really amazing stuff you're up to. As I said, you know, I wish you the best with all this and the portfolio, the team that you have uh, behind you. Sounds amazing. And just, uh, you know, again, wishing you the best as, as you not just create these technologies for our war fighters, for the, the private sector, but, you know, protecting our country. Um Again, for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular uh, episode of our show across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Colonel Christopher Grice, Acting Director, Joint Science and Technology Office of the United States Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, Chris, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us and educate us on these themes for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing to protect the United States and your long service to the country. And as we like to say here on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for everybody be what you do. Really great story. And, and, and again, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Ira. I really appreciate this opportunity.